as you're finding your seats back, I want to thank you all for coming out uh, on Friday in the heat for astrology. Really appreciate it. And I want to really thank Moses for the opportunity to talk in another fantastic conference full of absolutely top-notch presenters. Uh, you've heard the best minds in the field speak in the last few days. And um, precisely for that reason, it is my guess that are your heads full of astrology right now? <laughs> Pretty full? Okay, that means everybody, I want you to stretch. And I'm 100% serious. <laughs> Get up and stretch. Your favorite stretch. Stretch. Touch your toes. Reach. Stretch. Because you're going to be stretching your mind with what I'm about to talk about. And, um,. Yeah, keep, keep stretching, as long as you want. Because we're really going to stretch in the next hour. And uh, I'm not going to talk about a t technique, and I don't have a single natal chart example. So there are no handouts, and no graphics. And for people that remember my talk last year, that's a good thing. Anyway, <laughs> there was, for those who weren't here last year, there was some technological difficulties which required some improvisation, so I figured, why bother? Um, so today, what we're going to be thinking about is a very large cycle and its potential impact uh, on the world and all of our lives. And it's not Pluto. It's not Pluto. It's about the stars and precession. Um, when I say precession, how many people know what I'm talking about? Most. Good. So, for those with a few hands that didn't go up, very simply, the thick stars moving across as related to the tropical zodiac move about a degree every 72 years. Uh, this is the grandest cycle of them all. It's about 26,000 years due to Earth's squabble on the axis. That's all you need to know. But that's why typically astrologers don't look into this that much. Because if you have one degree every 72 years, you know, like maybe if you're lucky, one particular star will cross a particular planet exactly to the minute at one point in your life, and then it's over. Right? That doesn't fit with the way most astrologers do things in terms of aspects and orbs. So generally, this is passed over in natal astrology. Although with the revival of traditional astrology, there is more awareness of planets making aspects to fixed stars in the chart, but not necessarily the motion of fixed stars precessing onto natals. Maybe a few people that look at that kind of thing, but it's, it's not typically done. So what I'm talking about is a particular event within this precession cycle that I think is going to be important. And the event is the fixed star Regulus moving into Virgo. And that is happening according to Solar Fire, <laughs> beginning of 2012. According to Janus, end of 2011 depending on whose ephemeris you use. But in, in a 2,000-year cycle, I'm not talking about months here, although some of the movements are quite amazing in how quickly things change to the year, even with this. So that's the event. Now, OK, I'm going to spend the next hour like unpacking this. Ready, listen to Virgo. So let's start with ready, list. What is it? Big star. Royal star, royal star of summer. This is a preeminent star. It's a very important star. It's not the brightest star in the sky, but it is very bright. And it's near the ecliptic, which means when planets are transiting through the sky, they'll come close to it. And throughout centuries, Regulus was one of the prominent stars. There are four uh, royal stars in the sky, and Regulus is the royal star of summer. 
And let's think about this, even just from the most simple perspective. The star is in the constellation of a lion, right? I'm not talking sun signs here, I'm talking about star constellations in the sky. Okay, so we have a ram, a bull, some chatty twins, a scuttling crab, a lion, a virgin, some scales, scorpion, an archer, a weird sea goat, a knowledge pourer, and some fish. <laughs> Who's boss? Who's boss? The lion! The lion's boss. I mean, the ram could put up a fight for a little while. Forget about the bull. The, the, the pins are not going to do anything. They're going to fucking grab. No the is Again, the, in terms of power and supremacy, the only, you know, sometimes we put up a challenge for a little while, the archer, if he had a good reason, maybe. But the lion is lost. Leah's lost. And then this star is called the heart of the lion. What's the strongest muscle in the body? The heart. Right? And this is this is very literal. This is this is the name for the for the star, um, the Arabic name. I I not I, uh, I don't know anything about pronouncing it Arabic, but Al Kab Al Asad means part of the lion. That's what they called it. And interestingly, other cultures too. Indian Nakshatra means mighty. Uh, another Arabic name means kingly. Um, and it, so. Just by the name of the star, the ancients were telling us it had something to do with power and strength and courage. The very word courage comes from core, French heart. And, um, okay, I, uh, I passed by, there's something I, a little bit I want to say about this heart theme. Because interestingly, the, the other royal stars of the sky, we have Aldebaran, the eye of the bull, Regulus, the heart of the lion. Um, and Taurus, the heart of the scorpion, and then Formapal, which is the mouth of the fish. Um, but just think about the heart for a minute. I mean, it beats every minute of every single day when you're asleep, even. I mean, try that with your bicep curls. You last like 10 minutes, even with a lightweight. <laughs> right? And the heart is just beating and beating and beating your entire life. Like, it's in a class by itself in terms of muscles. Literally, right? And so, from traditional texts, pretty much agree that Regulus is in a class by itself. I mean, maybe joined with a few of the other royal stars and very bright stars, but there are certain stars that are in class by themselves, and Regulus is one of them, and that's why they call that part of the lion. Very interestingly, in the last few years, I don't know exactly when, Modern science completely concurs. Uh, our sun spins at a leisurely, uh, makes a rotation, uh, about a leisurely three weeks, 24 days, sun spins around. And it's traveling about 4,500 miles per hour. That's our own sun, in terms of the speed that it travels. Regulus moves. 700,000 miles per hour. 700,000 <laughs> regulus, our sun, 4,500. And so when the, when the traditional texts are telling us that this has got a very intense energy, uh, thank you astrology for beating science to the punch once again by several thousand years, but I'm very glad to hear that science completely agrees with the traditional texts, you know, 2,000 years ago. Say that this star is really got some juice to it, and when you have, if you're born with planets on it, they're going to be juiced, and when transiting planets hit it, they are going to be juiced, and when things go on with the star, you know they are important events. Um, okay, so if I were doing a very complete lecture, at this point I would convince you with a whole host of natal charts and events that have Leo activated. But I have an hour, and I think you've seen enough charts. And um, in my own work and life, uh, natal charts are not my focus. I 
prefer real-time astrology, and that means I'm going to skip the natal charts, because I think the movement of Regulus and Virgo is important for all of us, and not just those with natal placements on Regulus. And I'm more interested in thinking about the potential implications of that change than examining, you know, yes, certain people will be born after Regulus moves into Virgo with natal placements, and maybe they will be particularly important in bringing about the changes that I'm, we're going to think about today. But, you know, until, for now, we're just going to think about the changes. And then we can see who's born with the connections to Regulus. Um, Well, not uh, Regulus' position currently in the sky is 29 Leo, and that means we all experience it any time the moon crosses 29 Leo, or the sun, or any other planet, just like any position, to some extent we all experience that energy, even if it's not directly in our natal chart. It's just the way it is right now, right? But come early 2012, Regulus will be in Virgo. So every time this intense power, this courage, this ability to lead, this strength, is going to take on a Virgo dimension instead of a Leo dimension, as it has for the last 2,000 years. That's why I think this is important, because the nature of power, strength, courage, leadership itself is going undergoing a, what I think will be a very um, substantial change. And to help um, convince you of this, presenting a short history of the world as seen through the journey of Regulus through the Earth. What I mean by this is, Regulus wasn't always in Leo. 2,000 years ago, it was in Cancer. But about 150 BC, Regulus entered Leo. Now, Some quick clarification: is the star itself? I'll say. A quick clarification: the we mentioned the star moving 700,000 miles. The star itself is moving spinning so, on its axis. On its axis. Yeah, okay. yeah. I mean, it's stationary, just like our sun, but just in terms of the rotational spin. Yeah. So, in that sense, from a modern science sense, okay. it, just the energy of the star is extremely potent. And, and from the astrologically uh, astrology text interpretation view, that pretty much bears out that a very, very common events happen with this star activated. The other motion we're talking about today has to do with precession. Like Entirely different. That's the fixed star's relation to the tropical zodiac, and that moves about a degree every 72 years. And that's valid for all stars. Is that Approximately, yes. Approximately, but uh, fixed stars, and in terms of the sidereals, that, the zodiac, that's the way it is, right? There, there's no precession. In it. The precession is the relationship between the fixed stars and the tropical zodiac. Okay, so as Moses mentioned, the signs have certain characteristics, but they're not just signs. It's not just like, you know, zero Leo to the end of Leo is all the same. The signs have various things going on with them. And some of you who have been around for talks, uh, several uh, people here have mentioned working with the terms. Divisions of the sign. Now, if you didn't attend these talks, I can't explain everything about the terms. But I mean, I like the terms very much. I do financial work. I predict the stock market every single day. I like the terms. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> and in terms of which system, I like the Egyptian terms. I'm completely sold on the Egyptian terms. In fact, I put money on the Egyptian terms. And that's all you need to know <laughs> right now. But for the purposes of this lecture, it means that the first portion of Leo, we're not only just moving from Cancer to Leo, we're moving into term Jupiter because the first six degrees of Leo are termed Jupiter. That's all you need to know right now. And I've given you my reason. And if you don't understand it, you can email me later and, you know, whatever, catch up on the terms. But I really recommend looking into the terms. So, 
Is this not a particularly glorious combination? Leo and Jupiter put together, right? So what happens in the history of the world after 150 BC? Any ideas? No, the rise of the Roman Empire. <laughs> rise of the Roman Empire, which was one of the largest empires. I mean, there were empires before Rome. And there were empires after Rome. But it, it does so happen that the Roman Empire covered nearly over 5 million kilometers, <laughs> nearly 6. And uh, although Alexander the Great did precede Rome and had an empire of his own, the saying is not all roads lead to Athens. The saying is all roads lead to Rome. The Roman Empire was a new kind of entity in the, in the sense of its power, its scope. I mean, Roman roads were built in England, you, you, right? There were Roman roads in England because of that, that had that kind of expansive power and command and control. And coincidentally, or not, from this perspective, one of the largest Chinese empires also came into being during this time. It's the Han Empire. And um, I'm just pulling this off from Wikipedia. But, uh, the, you know, if you look up Chinese history, there are a long list of Chinese dynasties. And I'm by no means an expert. But this was another empire that was about five and a half million square kilometers. So at the same time in history that the Romans were like completely expanding, creating an entirely new dynamic of government, a very, I'm not saying it was the same, but we do have another empire in China happening at the same time with a similar reach. And as an astrologer, I'm saying Leo Jupiter, and I'm saying that makes sense. That the expansion of Jupiter and the power of Leo is what drove the rise of empire. That's all. And um, so towards the end of this period, uh, the Roman Empire started to fall apart 235 BC, I mean, excuse me, 235 AD. So Regulus went into Leo 150 BC. Um, the rise of the Roman Empire was um, let's see, I don't know if I have years, a little bit before, but right in there, 100 BC, around the turn of the century, 100 AD, there were all a succession of Roman Empire, the Roman emperors. Um, but around um, 235 to 284, there was kind of a, con a crisis because there were lots of succession. So those years, 235 to 284, Wikipedia is listing the Roman Empire was kind of already sketchy because there were 25 different emperors in that, you know, roughly 30 years. That means they didn't have significant power. And, according to Solar Fire, 278 AD was the year that Regulus changed terms from Jupiter into Venus. So as Regulus left term Jupiter into term Venus, so the first six degrees of Leo are Jupiter, and we have Venus, 6 to 11, that the empires lost their ability to maintain power. And, in fact, um, there was a kind of compromise of the Roman Empire. It was split into two, and one emperor took one half, one emperor took another half, and then there were four emperors, and they all kind of got along, and they ruled by, like, group. <laughs> Um, what I'm getting at here is the New Zealand themes of kind of sharing and compromise and less of the drive and domination and just sheer expansion of Jupiter. Just some compromise going on. And, and I have to think there was 25 emperors in the later years. Maybe there was a little bit of partying. <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe. I could be wrong. Um, similarly, though, in China, after 303, there was a rebellion and the dynasty fell apart. 
There was a series of short-lived warlords, and interestingly, the, 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 what had been the empire in China was Confucian Empire. Buddhism was then allowed in China, but that was only after Regulus entered the term of Venus. This was, a, this was a compromise, because the empire before this had been very strictly Confucian. And um, there was also a uh, development of an equal land system, like land allotted to need and not to wealth, which I'm kind of saying, it seems like Venus and compromise and, um, you know. Um, and if, if both empires had kind of periods of successions of lots of emperors, I mean, something's going on. I don't know the exact reasons because I'm not an expert in either of these fields of history, but either they didn't have the power or they were partying too much, or whatever. But it, they, didn't, they just couldn't have the same scope as they did with Regulus in term of Jupiter. Okay, next stage, 641 AD. Reg Regulus moves into term of Saturn, where it stays um, until 1146. So that's the astrology period, 641 to 1146. Anyone know what um, this period is, most of this period is commonly referred to? Dark. Dark. The Dark Ages. <laughs> How good is that? <laughs> and it, it's very literally true, in the sense there was a decline in literature, decline in population, attacks by barbarians, you know, limited building activity, the history, like, disappeared from Britain for an entire century. <laughs> There's just no written records of any kind. Um, but what was happening was that life, the life that did exist was happening in the monasteries. And the same period, it's not called the Dark Ages, it's called the Benedictine centuries, because the monks were really kind of the ones keeping things alive. And um, Benedictines had a pretty strict schedule. You don't know anything about the Benedictines. The modern Trappists are the closest variety that we have to what the Benedictines were doing. But this, they were cloistered. You know, they got up, they prayed, they ate little, they prayed, they worked, they prayed, they slept little, then they did it again. Yes. Yeah, that's a very good point. I'm gonna I'm gonna mention that. Uh, the question for the audience is, what about Rise of Islam? I will, I will mention that. Yeah? Speaking of interesting addition to that, Benedictine monks, according to a book called Prime Wars, they're the ones who created the clock because of the time. Oh, interesting. Right. right. They're, they're regulating their, 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 their hours. Their yeah. Prayer, yeah. Clock, so right. Um, now, okay, so main points about Saturn in the I mean, Regulus and Neo-Saturn, Dark Ages, Benedictine order, orders living a very close, cloistered life. And um, uh, in China, the dynasty weakened. There's not a lot of information about this period in China, uh, so I'm not going to go on about it. And I did want to mention that, to be fair, this was a golden age in Arabic cultures. And so I, I don't mean to just skip over this lightly, but I do think that different cultures can respond differently to similar energies, just like people do, in the sense that we say we deal Saturn, okay, we could have a decline of civilization, really just hardship, you know, war, nothing happening, like happened in Europe. Or we can have a monk, or we can have maybe just lots of agrarian work without a lot of something else. Or maybe there's a real pursuit of knowledge and science. Right? Is this all? possible with Saturn, and for whatever reason, Arabic cultures really flourished under this, whereas Europe and China clearly saw a decline. Moving on to the next term. I want to spend, now, time is taking away, and I have 35 minutes, and so please, um, if you have comments, that's great, but uh, if you could, I'm going to try and speed it up, but um, you know, I want to keep on schedule for the next speaker. 1146, Leo Mercury, and the reason why this term is particularly important is because if we're thinking about what might happen with great listen to Virgo term Mercury. Virgo is the sign ruled by Mercury, the first seven degrees are term Mercury. We want to know what's going on with 
the last term of Mercury that we have, which was 1146. There were several incredible, interesting developments, and for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of list them quickly, and you'll get the point. Um, the cloistered monks gave way to mendicant orders, which meant wandering. They went out of the monastery and started working among the poor. Um, knighthood emerged as a way for serfs to free themselves from the land. You know, slaves to the land, very much scattered the experience. They could become a knight and, you know, ride around on a horse and be free at least and, you know, joust and things like this. Um, 1158, just, you know, a handful of years after solar fires pegging this to exact, there was something called the Hanseatic lead, which was a trade agreement for various free cities to advance trade by the sea. This was a new thing, you know. This was this, to, for various cities to agree to trade. Um, population, uh, trade in general, commerce, uh, all increased, cities developed, developed um, and, you know, guilds, uh, various orders, all this commerce, mercurial activity, learning, skills, knowledge, all of these came um, increased during what is called the High Middle Ages um, in Europe. And, very interestingly, universities came into being. Before Red List into term Neo-Mercury, basically universities did not exist because all the learning that there was was in the monasteries. There was only one that existed, but uh, University of Paris, 1160, remember that is just about 15 years after Regulus moved into Leo Mercury, University of Paris is being formed. Oxford, 1167, Cambridge, 1209, and then a whole host of others. Prior to this time, universities did not exist. I find this very significantly important. Because the entire model of how knowledge was transmitted and what knowledge was you know, allowed and what knowledge exists completely changed with regulus into term record. Um, inventions. Windmill, watermill, printing, paper, ships, you know, eventually the printing press, and a complete change in language. The development of vernacular languages, Italian, French, Spanish, you know, prior to this we had Latin and Greek, right? People could read and write were the monks and they were doing Latin and Greek, but it was during this whole Mercury period that all the vernacular languages and then writing in the vernacular languages happened. Right? I also that, that that's important. <laughs> that's important. Um, music changed from plain chant of the monks to polyphony, like just more sounds at once. And then an entire generation of singers called the troubadours who sang of courtly love emerged, uh, which was a new thing. Uh, tr trade itself changed in the sense of um, Ven Italy, and I think Venice in particular changed or developed uh, banking and credit and insurance and accounting. And in you know, for the astrology view, I can make in, a connection to uh, Mercury to all these phenomena. Learning, intelligence, knowledge, skills, variety. Makes sense to me. Um, and in Italy, they started educating women. Interesting. During this time. Term education. Uh huh. They really changed. Yeah. During yeah. Just knowledge in general. Yeah, for sure. In China, uh, according to Wikipedia again, the dates of the Song Dynasty listed 960 to 1279. So starting a little bit before the date of the Leo Mercury event, uh, but still, uh, quote, great technology development, high point in science and technology during this time. So I guess, you know, at some point, there's all these developments in China happening as well. Then in the Ming Dynasty, which began in 1368, uh, we, you know, it's population growth, division of labor, uh, particularly rise of industries like paper, silk, cotton, porcelain, lots of trade with the hands, just, you know, mercury thing as well, uh, just town markets, foreign trade in general. And perhaps the best example of the significance of this is that the imperial city 
uh, which is you know China's like grand jewel, uh, was built from 1406 to 1420. It took over a million workers that period of time, and it, it was built from materials from all over China. I mean, think about recording a million workers without a computer. <laughs> You're talking some serious record keeping and and some you know just some managerial abilities and. Um, I view this as uh, that those in power had to have some mercurial skills in order to make this happen. Okay, uh, 1580, we Regulus enters Leo Mars, and I'm just going to go faster through this. Uh, this Mars period is obviously lasting up until the current day. So in Europe. You know, exploration had kind of begun, but what was interesting was that just four years after this date, the first British settlement settlement was in America, in, in uh, Roanoke. So prior to this, there was exploration, but there was no settlement. Okay, what happens if you put people on somebody on the land? Like you're not just in a ship, like you know, oh sailing by, oh it's nice, there's a map, right? You're starting to settle. That means conquest, Mars, right? And so basically, 1580 to the present day, the age of exploration and conquest began. And European history from 1580 is pretty much just constant war. We have the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. We have the French and Indian War and the American colonies. We have the American Revolution, war with the British, uh, or British Empire, England versus Spain versus France. Uh, American Revolution, you know, followed by the War of 1812, the French Revolution, followed by the Napoleonic Wars, the Franco-Prussian War, World War One, Revolution, Russian Revolution, Fascism, like, it's just, you know, where is there not a war in European history? <laughs> 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s. It's like, once in a while you get a short break, when there's nobody left to fight, and then a generation grows up and starts fighting you. Um, but to Mars' credit, there was tremendous uh, scientific uh, revolution and industrial revolution, which involved machinery and power through coal and iron and also you know, Mars things. Um, and a lot of economic progress brought about through slavery, complete and utter domination of other humans uh, to the utter extreme. I mean, yes, slavery existed before this, but you know. Um, just a lot of um, so-called economic progress was really built on slavery during this time. And um, in China, the Qing Dynasty, 1644 to 1911, this was a conquest of the previous Ming Dynasty, and during this conquest, 25 million people died. That means there was a lot of fighting going on in China as well. And um, the elites in China, instead of the tradespeople, became the military. There was something called the Eight Banners. And their things were things like archery and horsemanship, and the people who excelled at the, these were the elites of the society. And then similarly, just like Europe, there was a whole host of revolutions and war, and especially as we get closer to the 19th and 20th century, it's just Opium War, 1840, Taipei Rebellion, 1851, 20 million people killed, and just rebellion after rebellion until we get to the 20th century, uh, which of course uh, begins World War II. Now, uh, traditional astrologers in the audience, is there anything particularly bad about the 29th degree? And by that I mean what is properly called the 30th degree. I mean 29.0 to 29.59. Is there anything like, is there any negative comments in traditional texts about that degree? What does that mean? Degree of atonement and you're back to do a special job that you can complete in your prior life. Yeah. Is there any does anyone know of any traditional source that classifies that as a negative degree? It's a mastery degree. Hmm? It's a degree of mastery. Degree of mastery? Who says that? Okay. I'm just interested in traditional sources, though. I mean, Vedic tradition, it's called Sandhya Sri. Yeah. Problematic? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. That's what I want to hear. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So, 
According to Solar Fire, Regulus entered the 29th degree, and by that I just mean 29.0. If you're being technical, this is actually the 30th degree. I don't want to get into that right now. This was February 1939. And later that year, Hitler invaded Poland and began World War II, which was the largest military conflict the world had ever seen, involved 100 million soldiers. Uh, over time, uh, 70 million people were killed, including 12 million in concentration camps. Uh, and of course, since then, uh, you know, to the present day, Regulus in the 29th degree of VO, I put this in a class by itself, simply because in addition to, the, in addition to World War II, Cold War, unprecedented buildup of military weapons, uh, you know, nuclear weapons, for the first time, millions of people dying and bombs were covering. Korean War, Vietnam War, Imperial Japan, Soviet Union, under Stalin, who knows how many people died, Khmer Rouge in Cambodia, Bangladesh, Rwanda, Darfur, Africa, Balkan War, and continues in Iraq with over 1 million dead. Now, I don't need to be too gloom and doom. I'm just listing these as facts. Uh, in China, the same period was Chairman Mao, who was so intent on producing steel that diverted resources away from food, and as a result, massive famines, 20 the estimates range from 20 to 43 million people dying. Uh, this was followed by the Cultural Re Revolution, which was kind of a reign of terror in China, uh, where millions and millions of people were persecuted. Anyone who doesn't, you know, had any education was sent off to the farms, and many people died during that as well. My point here is that Regulus in the 29th degree we have clearly, without any doubt, seen the worst of government, the most destruction of humankind in the history of our planet, just in the last you know, few decades. And it coincides precisely. I mean, there was destruction and war before this with Regulus and Term Mars. But I do think there's been something going on since 1939 because you know, it's out of control across the globe. So, for this very simple reason, I have a very good reason to be optimistic about 2012 because Regulus is going to get out of Leo. Now, I like Leo, but you know, the 29th degree has been a bit of a problem, <laughs> right? And so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to get some Virgo energy replacing this Leo thing going on. And for that reason alone, I'm optimistic about 2012. Because I think it will change the nature of power. What was the date you gave for 2012? I didn't give one because depending on who's a feminist you check, you couldn't even be late to 2011. And, but I do think um, you know, January 2012. I mean, uh, and that that that's something I'll if I have time, uh, you know, maybe I'll investigate. But for now, in 20 minutes in the talk, okay. <laughs> if I'm right, I have two more really juicy things that I have to cover. If I'm right that Regulus and Virgo is going to be really important, there's basically two other events we can very simply check. And that is, OK, if Regulus is a world star and it's changing signs, then what was the last world star to change signs? And did that generate really anything important? Right? Because if it did, then we're on to something. If it didn't, my thesis is a bit of a So. The last royal star, royal, royal star of winter is called Fomalhaut, mouth of the fish. You have to understand what the star just means at a very basic level. Mouth of the fish is receiving the knowledge from Aquarius, the knowledge work. It has to do with received knowledge, which can also be faith. You know, anything you're taught, it's receiving the knowledge, right? So we just think, okay, what we're taught what we learn, what we believe. That's what, uh, on an exalted level, that's what Formaha has to do. This changed signs from Aquarius into Pisces in 1725. No. No. From Aquarius into Pisces, 1725. Recession goes in order to sign, just right, right, right it's going from Leo to Virgo. Um, Emmanuel Kant was born in 1724. 
And I know I'm dragging up some philosophers that, you know, some of you may be read and call it, some of you didn't. But the point is, there were seeds of the uh, European so-called Enlightenment with Descartes, which was definitely before this, in 1600s or so. But Immanuel Kant really hit the nail on the head with critique of pure reason, because basically he's saying, why put your belief in faith when you can put your belief in reason? That would, I mean, I'm being very simplistic here. If, if, if Rick Tarnas is in the audience or a character, his book is the, the definitive source on this. But the, what this brought about was the European Enlightenment, which essentially dismantled centuries old belief in the church and replaced it with a belief in science, which continues to completely dominate our culture to this day. Our entire scientific and materialist, materialist culture arose, and capitalist culture arose out of the European Enlightenment, whose almost foremost, I, I can probably say without exaggeration, foremost thinkers, you know, began with Kant and then his successors, and then artists that had been influenced by Kant. All of this happened 1725 and beyond, and then we have all the revolutions for freedom and things like this. That that you know. So, in my view, that gets a check. <laughs> Formal help moved changing signs resulted in a paradigm shift. I'm talking big. You know, for centuries people believed that like the role of God was in the world and have faith and do God's works, and all of a sudden that's changed into scientific progress, materialism, and capitalism. This is, this is just a complete change. And if you want to know more about the significance of the European Enlightenment, you can follow up online or read Rick Tarnas' book. But it did coincide with the change of formal how in new science. And now I have probably a clearer example, a little bit better example, that the previous Royal Star to change science, there was actually two at once, because Aldebaran, the Royal Star of Spring, and then Taris, the royal star of autumn are very closely opposite. So when one changes signs, the other is going to change signs. And so um, Aldebaran, the eye of the bull, has to do with seeing innovations, creation, change signs out of Taurus, out of tropical Taurus, into Gemini, 1298. And then Antares moved out of Scorpio into Sagittarius just a year later, 1299. Anybody have any ideas about the significance of this time? I mean, on a big level. Big level. The plague. Mm-hmm. What did you say? 1298, 1299. When is the Renaissance said to have begun? Scholars say there's no real official date, but they kind of like Dante as a first important Renaissance figure. Because Dante was important because he wrote a story that a human was experiencing religion with, you know, his guys were Virgil and Beatrice, not a pope. It was a humanistic perspective in Dante. He started writing that divine comedy shortly after 1500. 1300. Shortly after, there's not an exact date. So, virtually two years after Aldebaran, the star of seeing and new creation, is changing signs from Taurus into Gemini, sign of writing and curiosity. Um, you have Dante writing Divine Comedy, and then for centuries, scholars saying, yes, this was a significant change. This is a milestone. Things are changing. And then also, um, Giotto. Uh, painted a Scrovenni chapel, and if I'm not pronouncing that right, apologies. Um, this was the first paint painting, the nature of painting completely changed. Prior to the Renaissance, people were flat. Light was just like a golden red. Giotto completely broke that wide open because he depicted humans in 3D. And light in a realistic way. You know, if you were a European in 1300, you were going to church once a week, <laughs> and the art that you saw there might have been like the cultural high point of your week. And all of a sudden, you're seeing this depicted in a completely different way. You know, this is this is this is major. 
this is like the introduction of TV in American culture. It's just like changing everything, right? Anyway, there was much more to the Renaissance, and I had so much more to say, and I'm just, I'm going to have to move on. But basically, the beginning of the, the movement of these stars times the Renaissance, it nails it. And it's not a stretch. When I think about the themes of the Renaissance, development of human perspective, you know, what happened in art and painting, um, it, and you think about the, just the meaning of Aldebaran into Gemini, it makes a lot of sense um, if you know the themes of the science. And there was, let's see, yeah, I think I'll just skip him. Uh, Antares, part of the scorpion, destructive power, moving into Sagittarius, is, in my view, probably what aided the vast exploration and conquest that took place over the next several centuries. Uh, that all the imperial cultures that were um, you know, dominating the world were basically after resources. and It was not like a very nice, cooperative kind of thing. It's a very destructive thing in many places and uh, just a drive for resources and domination. So I, I kind of, you know, check <laughs> paradigm shift. <laughs> because, and so so that's, that's what I wanted to do. I could say, okay, the last two times world stars changed signs were A, the European Enlightenment, and B, the Renaissance. And the next event that we have on an order of this magnitude is 2012. Ready to listen to Virgo. This is it. So based on this line of thinking, I'm not, I'm not a rosy eye kind of guy. I'm not like mass consciousness, mass enlightenment, you know, like that. No, I'm very uh, kind of precise, but based on history, I have every reason not just to hope for a paradigm shift, but to fully expect one in 2012. Okay, so given the time left, given what we know about Leo and Virgo, now, I think, well, we'll see what I can do. What might change? Agriculture. Definitely. How so? Well, I think it might become more individualized. Possibly. You mean less corporate? <coughs> more sustainable? More sustainable, perhaps? Sustainability? Is this a theme that we can expect? It, it fledging stages, right, already. You know, organics, locals, things like this. Could this expand on a dramatic scale? Well, already we've got regulations on certain steroids and animals and so forth. Right. And they're getting more and more strict. Right. However, there are still like how many millions of pounds of pesticides pumped into our environment every year? Okay. It's, yeah. Now, I would love, if I had an hour and a half, I'd interact with you the rest of the time. But I have like 10 minutes, and I'm just going to go for it here and get you thinking. Because uh, there's a lot, a lot to this. I'll just say, I wish I could. It was my plan to do so because I wanted to do it on a Friday, but I'm just going to just go through some things here. Um, if the nature of power, I think the nature of power will shift from might makes right to uh, an in intelligent use of power. Like, power just can't be based on military domination. Yeah, exactly. There's got to be a, a good reason for things. And, you know, the Leo King wants to build a bomb and drop it in another country. He's just going to do it. But from the Virgo perspective, if we build a bomb, okay, we're taking resources to build a bomb, which we're then going to use in a worst-case scenario when we can't figure out a smarter solution, then drop it on the country, kill a bunch of people, wound a bunch of others, which will have to take care of health care, and then clean up the mess, Nix the bomb. <laughs> right? Nix the bomb. That's the Virgo perspective. And similarly with armies, from the Virgo perspective, okay, we have how many millions of people? Okay, let's let's say they were not in Iraq. I mean they are in Iraq, but let's say they're not. Virgo perspective and army. Wait a minute. We have millions of people, young people, strong people, with muscles, men and women, who want to serve and do some good. And they're sitting around in a camp, in a base with no interaction with the public and basically achieving no good whatsoever. What's wrong with this picture? The Virgo perspective would be let's put them to work. So I think there could be an incredible chain of kind of like national service corps or just you know the idea of service or rearranging our resources. And if people think this is some kind of you know 
extreme, like how can we live without an army? Well, each of the epics through the turns, you know, from their perspective, like from the perspective before the Roman Empire, when the Roman Empire came along, that was like unthinkable. And then the period of the New Zealand Compromise to the Jupiter period, that was unthinkable. Compromise in the Empire? And then the Dark Age to the Roman Empire, the Dark Ages, they're like, that was unthinkable. And then to the Dark Ages, the Mercury period was all the knowledge and development and trade that happened. That was unthinkable. And then to all the Mercury period, the tradespeople, all the war was completely unthinkable. And then I can go to the examples with the European, you know, the European so-called enlightenment to people that have century after century of believing in God, and then all of a sudden say, wait a minute, this isn't important, we're gonna put our energy into science. That's like totally incredible. And then the Renaissance, like uh, the human perspective that came out of the Renaissance, you know, totally incredible. So for me to say, maybe some governments will realize they can have a completely different concept of army, doesn't seem like so much of a stretch. And I'm, I'm you know, I may be, I'm aware that I have a certain political perspective and I'm trying not to just impose my will on the astrology, but I'm just trying to say, you know, power, strength, courage, which is regulus, expressed in a Virgo fashion, will not really, well, I think we'll have smarter things to do with people and resources than build bombs and have huge armies. And I think that's reasonable. Okay. Um, other themes. What is Virgo? Uh, okay. Leaders in general. Leaders are just going to have to be smart. There's, there's not, they're going to have to have good reasons for doing things and they're going to have to have results from their policies. Democrat or Republican, they can just do things because they say they want to do them because, you know, whatever. It's like, okay, no, what are your policies? What are your plans? What's going to work? What's not? Who's checking? Virgo, right? Um, you know, male, female, either one, but they're going to have to get things done. Uh, and that applies to government and anything. Corporation, anybody in a position of power is going to have to be, you know, be smart about it and get things done. And, uh, you know, no, just be on it in that sense. So what does Virgo know how to do? Virgo can criticize. <laughs> so there will be a whole rise in like consultants or knowledge publishers who can really point out everyone's mistakes, you know, productivity issues, and measurable. Virgo wants solid data and results. Like, so I think all this, you know, really could change. Like, you know, if, if you're in an HMO, right, do you know the survival rates of people who undergo a certain operation? Probably not. You know, do you know there are all different kinds of information that we could that maybe we'll start to get interested in. Um, okay, what else drives Virgo? Cleanliness, and this applies to a past. Okay, so we mentioned the sustainability theme, and that of course applies to organic and local. Um, this can expand in a dramatic way. Uh, you know, cars, architecture, any basically everything that's out there needs to be reworked from a sustainable perspective. That is in fledgling stages, but I have every reason to expect that from 2012 forward, that is what's going to go on. And the people that know how to do that and have the skills to do that will be the ones that are the elites, the ones that are looked up to in society, and, and those who are successful, uh, either here or other countries. Um, you know, oil and energy, of course, is a huge issue. Now, of course, Virgo loves the idea of getting people to work. It's not work that's the problem. It's how we're getting to work that needs revamp. Either, you know, the fuel or the transportation or something. Um, Virgo also likes to be healthy. So there could be, you know, a, and for not just Oh, get sick, go to a doctor, get fixed, and ignore until you get sick again, but all kinds of preventative health and tests and different pay scales for people who have different things going on in their blood. Very possible. Um, nu uh, nutrients, nut nutrition science, also possible. Um, productivity, Virgo specialty, right? So anyone who knows how to get something done in a better way, like that's the ticket. Because Virgo wants to be productive, wants to get better, wants to have results. 
and, and we have all kinds of labor. And if there's a better way to do it, then let's do it. So I have every reason to expect a just dramatic change in the whole the entire workforce uh, in the coming decades, what they're doing. Um, and if we, if we have certain skills and things going on in labor, they have to be educated and smart or know how to do things. And remember that the entire concept of university arose during the last term of Virgo Mercury. So there might be educational reform focusing on skills and, and learning how to do things. Uh, reputation. Virgo is very concerned about its own reputation, so to my view that means watchdog agencies, you know, are you on the up and ups, things like this. Service. Uh, this is happening, you know, in part, but what if we had an idea that the real leaders in society were not just business leaders or, you know, hedge fund managers prior to this year, they were the hot ticket, like, who the elites are is flexible, changes decade by decade. Could be one decade's a war general, next decade's a document person, next decade's a hedge fund person. What if we have a, a several decades where the elites are serving, doing some good? Um, Google, sorry I'm speeding up, but, and I hope I'm not going too fast, but I, this stuff is so interesting, I did want to at least mention. Um, Google.org is an arm of Google company that invests 1% of its equity, which is a lot of money, <laughs> into both for-profit and not-for-profit endeavors to solve various problems. It reads like a Virgo checklist. Energy, transportation, preventative health, education, small business, and other humanitarian aid. And my question is, well, Google's doing it. What if every other company in the Dow 30 and every other company in the 500 companies in the S&P 500 and every other company in the NASDAQ all contributed 1% of their stock uh, equity into both nonprofit and for-profit ventures to solve these kind of problems in the next decade, they would be solved very, very quickly. <laughs> um, lastly, in the time that's remaining, I would like to suggest a paradigm shift in capitalism itself, in the sense that right now we pretty much have, I want it, I buy it, and if I can't afford it, I don't need a credit card. Until this year, of course. What if we had a sense of, do I want to spend my money on this? Is the pleasure worth the cost? Can it fit in my budget? Okay, that's the standard Virgo stuff, but beyond that, what happens to the money after it's in somebody else's hand? Is the company I'm spending my money on treating its employees well? You know, this is already in fledgling stages. It's called fair trade. But what if this really expands? Um, that, that almost every dollar that you purchase, you, you, know, you know its consequences. And so it's not just to enrich some other company, but you want to know what benefit that your dollars is doing when it leaves your hands. This is a Virgo perspective. You know, con consequences um, of resources. Um, we'll probably lose some things. We'll lose some splendor of expression. Maybe sports. Maybe Virgo idea of a good time will be instead of 40,000 people screaming in a football stadium, will be 40,000 people at a beach cleanup. <laughs> um, but considering the mess that we're in, I say, you know, thank goodness, <laughs> let's, you know, let's get on with Regulus into Virgo, and that's why I'm optimistic for 2012. Um, thank you very much. Now, in closing, I'd like to say, that uh, I'm an astrologer, I'm a financial astrologer. This is what I do 100% of the time. And if you find yourself wanting a more productive use of astrology than staring at natal charts, a use of astrology that cannot just, can be just as fun and more exciting as you profit from the changes in the marketplace that take place right along with the planets, you can uh, see me after 
send an email to jpearl12 at gmail.com. You can visit my website uh, at starpearls.com and contact email that way. And basically, you know, if you like fast moves, you can trade fast. If you want to trade twice a week, you can trade twice a week. If, or you, know, you can use astrology to manage IRA money, trades over months. But that's what I do, and if you're interested, you know, you can contact me. And thank you very much, and hope you found this. All right, we're going to break for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then we're going to.